All right, so we're ready to start then with the last piece of the chapter 14 here on equilibrium. And it is probably the most important piece just because it's the one that we're going to use the most often out of this chapter. Because up until now, everything that we've done with calculating equilibrium constants has been, well, here's this reaction system and here are the concentrations of all the substances at equilibrium. What's the value of K? And that's easy. Yeah, I just plug it in and I put in the exponents and away I go. But when we're doing actual experimentation, that's not how it works. We'll know the initial concentrations. And we might know something about the final concentration of one of the ingredients, but we won't know everything. And so the challenge that is put in front of us is how do we bridge those two worlds? How do we bridge what we know about the initial concentrations of everything that we start the reaction with? and what we need to know to figure out the rest. So what we need to do is we need to develop some kind of a method that's gonna help us to use that initial concentration data because that's the stuff that's easy for us to get. And this is where we introduce something called an ice table. Now, your textbook, is going to use a slightly different term for this. They're going to call it a rice table. All that is different between an ice table and a rice table is whether or not we label the reaction as R or not. But in an ice table, what we are looking at is for the chemical reaction itself, what are the values for the initial concentration, the equilibrium concentration, and the change in concentration that led us to that equilibrium state. That's where ice comes from, initial change and equilibrium. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a reaction and we're gonna walk through the steps of how to build this ice table, what kind of situation we would use an ice table. And we'll go through some practice problems that kind of apply that. And then as I promised, we'll take a break and we'll look at the lab data that we collected yesterday for that complex ion and we'll apply this technique to that and kind of try to bridge what we already know about the complex we already know the initial concentrations of the two reactants we already know the final concentration of the complex ion product how do we marry those two to figure out in our case, the value of the equilibrium constant that governs that reaction anyway. So let's take a look at an example. Here we have an equilibrium reaction between nitrogen and oxygen to make nitrogen monoxide gas. The value of Kp, the uh, equilibrium constant for pressure here, is going to be one times 10 to the negative fifth. 
And we are told initially we have a starting pressure of 0.79 atmospheres for nitrogen and 0.21 atmospheres for oxygen. So our initial line here is going to be those starting values. So my starting value for nitrogen is the 0.79 atmospheres. And my starting pressure for the oxygen is 0.21 atmospheres. So I'm going to put those values both in their initial lines in the columns underneath their chemical formula. Now, I'm given no information about nitrogen monoxide. And if I'm not given any information about one of the substances, I am pretty safe to assume that that means that there isn't any there initially. And so since I'm not told anything about it, I'm going to assume an initial pressure of zero here. So because of that, I know which direction this is going. I could do a Q calculation, but it's not going to do us any good. Zero squared over... 0.79 divided by 0.21 is going to be zero. So I know that this is going to go toward the product. Since I know it's going toward the product, my next step would be to mark the change that each one of these pressures is going to undergo. And since I know that I don't have any product initially, I know I'm going to add some amount of nitrogen monoxide. I also know I'm going to lose some amount of each reactant. Now, I don't know how much I'm going to lose of either of them or how much I'm going to gain. But what I do know is that how much I gain or lose is going to be related directly to the stoichiometry of that reaction. I'm going to gain twice as much nitrogen monoxide as I'm going to lose nitrogen or oxygen based upon the chemical reaction. Now, since I don't know exactly what it is that I'm gaining or losing, I'm going to use these X terms to quantify how much is going to be gained or lost. And I know that this, the amount gained or lost is going to be a multiple of the same number. For the nitrogen and oxygen, it's going to be one portion of that number. For the nitrogen monoxide, it's going to be two portions of that number because the stoichiometry says two there. So when it comes to the equilibrium state, that last line, what I'm going to end up doing is adding these two lines together. The initial concentration or the initial pressure plus the change in pressure that is exerted is going to give me my equilibrium condition. And so what that means is that for the nitrogen monoxide, I'm going to end up with 2x. Whatever x is, I'm going to double it. That's going to be the amount of nitrogen monoxide that is present. For the nitrogen, it's going to be that 0.79 I started with minus whatever portion was lost. And for the oxygen, it'll be that 0.21 atmospheres that I started with 
minus whatever portion was lost. So now I have equilibrium values. Now they don't look very pretty right now, but they are equilibrium values. And if necessary, and it will be, I can put these values into an expression for K and use that expression to figure out what X end, ends up being if I know what K is. Because all I know is K is equal to, this is pressures. So pressure of nitrogen monoxide squared over pressure of nitrogen times the pressure of oxygen. I now have numbers, sort of, that mimic that. The pressure of nitrogen monoxide is 2x. That would be quantity squared. The pressure of nitrogen is 0.79 minus x. The pressure of the oxygen is 0.21 minus x. It's sloppy, it's not pretty, but it is functional. Because in the end, what I can do is this. So going back here to our value, we have K is equal to one times 10 to the negative fifth. And that was equal to two X quantity squared over 0.79 minus x and 0.21 minus x. Like I said, it's not forgiving. It's going to be not fun to solve, but it is doable. 2x quantity squared is 4x squared. I've got a do a binomial expansion here in the denominator. 0.79 minus times 0.21 is 0.1659 minus 0.79x minus 0.21x plus x squared. Where this is ultimately going to lead us to is a quadratic equation. So we can condense this denominator 0.1659 minus x plus x squared. Multiply it to the other side here. So 1 times 10 to the negative fifth times 0.1659, we're gonna get 1.659 times 10 to the negative sixth minus one times 10 to the negative fifth X plus one times 10 to the negative fifth X squared is equal to four X squared. Bring the four X squared term over by subtracting. 
1.659 times 10 to the negative sixth minus one times 10 to the negative fifth X. Um, one times 10 to the negative fifth minus four is negative 3.99 nine, 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 X squared. Now, if I were teaching this course, oh, say 10, 15 years ago, I would tell you to break out your quadratic equation, sing the little song and solve for X. Most of us have better capabilities than that. Um, most of you, because you are in other math classes, have access to a graphing calculator. Graphing calculators can solve quadratic equations relatively easily. Um, the internet is a great place to solve quadratics. where all we need to do is input those values, negative 3.99999, and negative one times 10 to the negative fifth, and 1.659 times 10 to the negative sixth. And we end up getting two values for this. Now, when we do quadratic equations, regardless of whether we solve them by hand or using a calculator or using an equation solver, we will always end up with two answers. One of the answers will not make any sense. In this case, it's the first one, because what the heck is a negative concentration? Other times we might find that one of the roots is bigger in concentration than our starting concentration. So obviously we could throw that one out as well. Certainly if any of the numbers are imaginary, we can throw those ones out as well. Nonetheless, um, to two significant figures, we're looking at the bottom one here, it's 6.4 times 10 to the negative fourth. And if we go back to these values now, now we can figure out what those actual concentrations are. Because concentration, or I keep saying concentration, that's wrong. This is atmospheres, not molar. The partial pressure of nitrogen monoxide was equal to 2x, which is equal to 2 times 6.4 times 10 to the negative fourth atmospheres. So with rounding 1.3 times 10 to the negative third, The pressure of nitrogen was equal to 0.79 minus X, 6.4 times 10 to the negative fourth. 
I'm going to guess that is not going to actually significantly change that pressure. Not with rounding. Um, calculator says uh, 0.78936. We only knew it to two decimal places before. We can't round it to more. So it's going to stay at 0.79 atmospheres. And we can probably assume the same thing for oxygen, but we'll make sure anyway. 0.21 minus 6.4 times 10 to the negative fourth. Two, 0.20936, so So this is what an ice table is, is all about. We're looking at solving quadratics usually. Um, we can always double check ourselves. So if we take those pressure values that we have after our calculations, we should get one times 10 to the negative fifth. So 1.3 times 10 to the negative third squared divided by 0.79 divided by 0.21. We get 1.02 times 10 to the negative fifth. That's rounding. So yeah, if we're, if we're only off on the last significant digit after doing all of this, we did a pretty good job. We can be pretty confident with where we are. All right, any questions with this example? Trayton. So if we go back to the very beginning of this walkthrough, we were told that the value of K was equal to one times 10 to the negative fifth for that equilibrium. So that is a value that would have to be given to us somewhere. We can't do an ice table like this without something to guide us. We just can't. We can't do we can't do an ice table without some kind of guiding guiding force behind it to help us make sense of it. All right, let's take a look at another example. We have a mixture of nitrogen monoxide, hydrogen, and water in a one liter vessel at 300 Kelvin. What is the value of K if the nitrogen monoxide concentration at equilibrium is 0 0.062 molar? So what we need to do is we need to set up another ice table. So I'm going to rewrite the equation here just so I can keep everything organized. And I'm going to draw out my ice table here as follows. Now, since all of this is in a one liter vessel, we can immediately convert those moles into molarities 
for our initial concentration. So 0.1 moles is 0.1 molar nitrogen monoxide. 0.05 moles is 0.05 molar hydrogen. 0.1 moles of water is 0.10 molar water. Again, we haven't been given any information about hydrogen, or excuse me, about nitrogen. So we can assume that that is zero. Since one of our products is missing, we know which way this equilibrium is going to flow. It is going to flow toward the product because we've got to have some of each product in order to be at an equilibrium state. So that means that we are going to lose some measure of reactants and gain some measure of products. How much are we losing or gaining? Well, it depends on the stoichiometry. For the reactants, I'm gonna lose two measures of nitrogen monoxide since the coefficient on the nitrogen monoxide is two. I'm gonna lose two measures of hydrogen since the coefficient there is two. And I'm gonna gain one measure of nitrogen and two measures of water as a result. Putting this all together, my equilibrium state is going to be 0.10 minus 2x for the nitrogen monoxide, 0.05 minus 2x for hydrogen, 1x for nitrogen, and 0.10 plus 2x for the water. Now, this is a different kind of equilibrium problem. This is actually almost essentially the same kind of equilibrium problem as what your lab is asking you to do for the complex ion. We can set up this ice table. And since we know that the end concentration of the nitrogen monoxide is 0 0.062, We now have a problem to solve. The problem to solve is this. 0 0.062 molar is the same as 0 0.10 molar minus 2x. And so if I do a little bit of algebraic rearranging, 2x is equal to 0 0.10 molar minus 0 0.062 molar. So 2x is equal to 0 0.1 minus 0 0.062. So 0 0.038. If I divide each side by two, that means that X is going to be equal to 0 0.019 molar. Since I know the value of X here, I can substitute it in each place in my ice table and do the calculations to figure out the equilibrium concentrations of each of these. So for nitrogen monoxide, we already know that it's 0 0.062. For hydrogen, we know that it's 0 0.05 minus 0 0.038. Reason I was able to come up with that one so quickly is because we're subtracting by 2x. And I also solved for 2x. Um, so one of the reasons I didn't do all the algebraic steps all at once was because I knew I needed the value of 2x and the value of x. 
So I made a deliberate stop in the middle to make sure I could calculate both. 0 0.05 minus 0 0.038 is 0 0.012. The concentration of nitrogen is just simply X. So it's 0 0.019 molar. And the concentration of water is 0 0.10 plus 0 0.038. So 0.138 molar for that one. Since I now know the equilibrium concentrations for everything, the last step is just simply to solve for K. K would be equal to the concentration of nitrogen, 0 0.019, multiplied by the concentration of water, 0.138. quantity squared divided by the concentration of nitrogen monoxide, 0 0.062 quantity squared divided by the concentration of hydrogen, 0 0.012 quantity squared. I do all of those 0.019 times 0.138 squared divided by 0.062 squared divided by 0.012 squared to two significant figures. I get a K value of 650. So this is more or less what you're being asked to do in the complex ion lab. You have the initial concentrations of the two reactants. You know that you start with an initial amount of zero complex. So that's your initial line. You can figure out the change line because the complex is going to gain concentration the two reactants are going to lose concentration. And your graph has given you the calculation, has given you the value of X because your graph tells you what the concentration of the complex is at equilibrium. So all you need to do is take that value, substitute it in for X, and you'd be able to find the equilibrium concentrations of the iron and the thiocyanate ion. And since you have all three of those concentrations, now you could solve for K. So we'll come back to that one in a little bit here. Any questions about this example? All right, let's do one more together and then we'll take a break and I'll let you try a couple of your own and then we'll get into some laboratory stuff as well. We have a reaction vessel at 400 Celsius filled with equal amounts of carbon monoxide and steam such that carbon monoxide and steam are equal to two atmospheres each. What is the partial pressure of hydrogen at equilibrium? The equilibrium constant is equal to 10 at this temperature. So the setup here is going to be similar to the other ones that we have done thus far. going to start with our balanced equation. 
And I'm going to make my ice table here on the side. Now, this time we are dealing with pressures. So I have two atmospheres of each of my reactants at the start. And again, it is safe to assume that we would have zero amounts of the two products here at the beginning because we're given no information about their presence at, at this initial time. Now, all of our reacting species here are one to one to one to one. So I know that I'm going to lose some amount of carbon monoxide, some amount of water, and I'm gonna gain some amount of carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And so at equilibrium, I would have two minus X for each of my reactants and X for each of my products. Now you may be thinking to yourself, well, this looks a lot like the first problem that we did. And you're right, it does. K is equal to the pressure of carbon dioxide times the pressure of hydrogen over the pressure of carbon monoxide times the pressure of water vapor. And that is equal to 10 which is equal to X times X over two minus X times two minus X. But there's one little trick here that we can use that actually simplifies this considerably. Notice that all of the terms in the numerator and the denominator are the same. So we can actually simplify this. X times X, that's, that's X squared. Two minus X times two minus X, that's also two minus X squared. I have a squared term in the numerator and a squared term in the denominator. Why can't I just get rid of those squares? And the answer is, yeah, yeah, you can. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the square root of each side. So when I do that, that's gonna give me the square root of 10 is equal to X over two minus X. Now we've got a problem that's way easier to solve. I don't need to use the quadratic equation to do it. I can just do it. So if I bring this over, I have square root of 10 times 2 minus the square root of 10x is equal to x. Now, your math professor would love you to keep this as square root of 10 and not actually turn it into real numbers because uh, they want everything exact. We don't need to be that precise. So let's turn this into something a little bit more manageable. Square root of 10 times two is 6.32. Square root of 10 is 3.16. If I get the X terms by themselves, 6.32 is equal to 4.16x, which would mean x is 
6.32 divided by 4.16. X is 1.52 atmospheres. And since that is also equal to the pressure of hydrogen, since hydrogen's pressure is equal to X. Now in problems like this, where we're calculating equilibrium concentrations, we can always go back and check ourselves. X being equal to 1.52 atmospheres. Means that two minus X would be 0.48 atmospheres. If I put those values in, 1.52 squared divided by 0.48 squared, I get 10.0 as my value of um, K. So again, so long as I'm within, you know, that last significant digit, um, I'm pretty, I'm feeling pretty good about that. So when you get problems like these, it's never a bad idea to see if it's possible to condense things down a little bit. As we get into more specific equilibria, what we'll find is that we will introduce other tips and tricks, things that'll make it less necessary to run quadratic equations all the time. But for right now, we need to assume that that's what we're going to be doing. Um, so let's go ahead and take a break. Um, let's just make it a short one though, uh, about five minutes, come back at, uh, nine 35.